So I think we're looking good and about ready to get started. So I want to tell you a little bit about the project that we're going to be working on today. This is a pattern called Bosom Buddy that we designed to make a seatbelt cushion. Uh, it's part of our promotion for October called So Pink, which is to raise awareness of breast cancer and get people out to get their mammograms and do the self checks and hopefully help um, raise some money for research to reduce the, the risk and, and damage that this horrible disease causes. This pattern makes a cushion that is people who've had breast cancer surgery often have a really difficult time when they get in the car because the seat belt you know, presses against areas that are sore and tender and makes it difficult to, um, to travel. And also anybody who's had surgery that maybe has a chemo port or something put in has the same problem. I have the same problem because I'm short and the seatbelt ends up riding up against my neck. So this is perfect for all of those things. It makes a, a cushion that has two layers of soft and stable. So it's really soft and cushiony. You just position it against your body, open the little let me do this without being right next to my microphone so it's not quite so loud. But it has a, a piece of hook and loop fastener on there. You position your seat belt on here, fold this over, fasten it, and then you can adjust the height um, wherever you need it. Hopefully I'm not messing your ears up with running this into my microphone. But anyway, this simple and easy to do, easy to adjust. And you know, even somebody who's had surgery on the stomach, they can wear it on the lap belt. There's so many ways to use it. So we're going to work to make this today. It's a simple and easy project. Hopefully you've already downloaded the pattern. The pattern is available at our website to download. Just go to patterns, click on the free patterns and you'll find it or do a search for Bosom Buddy and you'll find it. We did a full video tutorial to go with it that you can also download and watch. Um, but if you, uh, today we're going to walk through it as well. You might wanna watch that video if you missed something today or if you join us late because it goes through the whole project step by step. This um, is also available as a printed pattern. So if you don't have a printer or if you want to um, share them with your sewing group or your guild. Um, you can find them on our website in packs of 10. They're great for projects to do with friends. And they're um, printed in full color, four pages, so really easy um, to work with. A really nice heavy paper too. So that said, let's get started. So if you look at the pattern, you're going to see a list of supplies that you need. Basically, you need two fabrics a main fabric which becomes the body of the cushion and a coordinating fabric that we use to make the belt wrap and also the binding. There's so many ways you can mix this up if you want. We did one where we used just a single fabric because we wanted to see how that would look. This would make a great masculine one for a guy. I had to laugh when I saw this fabric because I said this would be perfect for my son-in-law because he could spill oil in it, on it and, and never get in trouble because it looks like that when it starts out. So that's a fun one to do, you know, depending on who you're making it for, this is a little more masculine design one, or you can go super feminine. We took this one and added some tulip pink ribbon down the front to embellish the belt wrap. There's just all kinds of ways that you can make this unique and, and really special for yourself or um, for someone else that you're making it for. These are awesome to do for gifts. If you know somebody who's had breast cancer surgery and you wanna make something special that they'll really enjoy, this is a, a great gift or to make as donations as well. So those are the fabrics you need. You also need some soft and stable, which is what we use inside for cushioning. This, we do double layers, so it's really extra soft. And we really strongly recommend using this. You, you could use batting if you have leftover batting, but it's not going to have nearly the same soft cushiony feel. So soft and stable, this is a great one because they're not very big pieces. A great one for using up scraps that you might have left over from a bag or purse project. 
Um, then you also need a bit of hook and loop tape. You may know this as Velcro uh, because that's a trademarked name. We, we can't use that in our patterns, so we call it by its generic purpose, which is hook and loop tape. Um, you'll need a seven and a half inch strip of that. So hopefully you've already cut out your pieces. We've got two pieces that we're cutting out of our main fabric, a front and a back for the cushion. I picked a fun fabric that has um, barns and sheep on it. I wanted to pick something that was directional so that we could talk a little bit about, you know, how you place those if you're using a directional fabric. And then I picked these fun little rain boots to use for my belt wrap. And then I picked a third fabric. I love stripes cut on a bias for binding. So I picked a red and white stripe to use for my binding. So I added a third fabric, which you're more than welcome to do too. This is a perfect project for using fabrics from your stash and little bits of leftovers from everything. In fact, my binding that I'm going to end up using was left over from another project too. So keep this in mind for um, anything that you might have left from another project. It doesn't use very much of anything. All right, the other thing you need is a little bit of interfacing and that's going to be used to interface the pieces for the belt wrap. So I've already prepared my pieces for my belt wrap by adding the interfacing to them, but in the pattern it tells you to do that as you prepare each piece. So we'll talk about those as we get to them. All right, so our very first step is to prepare the pieces for the cushion. And for that, we are going to use our two, our cushion front and back, which were cut from our main fabric, and our two pieces of soft and stable. These are all cut the same size. And basically what we're going to do is position our fabric on top of our soft and stable and stitch around the edge to hold the pieces together. You can do this with a walking foot, you can do it with a regular foot, um, whichever one you prefer. I didn't think, I actually have my walking foot here, but I think I'm just gonna use my regular foot. I'm most used to that. I do like when I do this, if I'm using a regular foot, to do one that's closed in the front so that the fabric stays nice and flat. So I'll probably put in like my number one or maybe I'll do my number 10 foot, my edge stitch foot and then I can use it to go all the way around. This is a great pro, um, procedure or technique to learn if you want to make a, any of our bags or purses and not quilt them. So we are not going to quilt these pieces. If you love the quilted look and would prefer to quilt these, there's no reason you can't. So if you wanna do some quilting lines through these, feel free. Your pieces might shrink up a little bit, which will make your cushion maybe a little bit smaller, but it's not gonna be the end of the world. Just make sure that they're both the same size when you go to put them together. So um, we've cut these, we're going to stitch around them. I'm just going to take some wonder clips and clip these together to hold the layers together. And then I'm going to sew an eighth of an inch from the edge all the way around to join the pieces. If you don't have wonder clips, you can also join them with pins. Let me finish clipping this one and then I'll show you a tip if you're using pins. So again, we're using just a single layer of soft and stable and a single layer of fabric. If you do want to do pins, I recommend that you get the pieces smooth so they're even all the way around. And then I like to put the pins in so that they're angled out. I think that helps put a little bit of pressure on the fabric and makes it kind of go a little bit straighter and holds it out to the outside. So we're going to get all of those pinned and then we're just going to sew an eighth of an inch from the edge around this. Again, I'm gonna switch to my edge stitch foot. This is a um, great foot that the Bernina makes that's like for stitching in the ditch but I like using it on this because I can line this little bar up against the edge, move my needle over, and then I know I'm the same, same distance away all the way around. All right, the other thing that I use if I'm not using a walking foot is I like using a stiletto because I can use it to help hold my fabric flat and keep it from moving away from me. So I hold it at a right angle to the needle about an inch ahead of where I'm sewing and I just use it to hold the fabric in place. 
All right, we're ready to go. So we're just going to sew all the way around each of these pieces. And I'm not, I'm gonna try not to talk while I do this, just because I don't want you to have to listen to me over the noise of the machine. I'll try and do it as quick as I can. In fact, I'm gonna lengthen my stitch length a little bit. Maybe that'll go faster. All right, one done. We'll do the next one quickly and then we can move on to make the belt wrap. The main thing when you're doing this is you wanna make sure that you're keeping your fabric nice and smooth. And the beautiful thing about soft and stable is that it has a really softly napped surface so it really helps hold that in place so it's not shifting and sliding on you. Okay, so we've got our cushion back done, our cushion front done. I guess we can decide which is going to be which. So one's going to go on the back, which is really not going to be visible. The other one's going to go on the front and the belt wrap's going to go right down the middle. I think I'm gonna make this the front because if I do that, you're gonna see little bits of barn and here it's going to be nicely hidden. So I'll set the back aside. On the front, we're going to mark some lines. And these are going to be two and a quarter inch down from the top and up from the bottom, and then two and an eighth inch from each side. And these are just temporary lines that are going to be used for attaching the belt wrap. So I'm gonna use something that's really temporary. I'm going to use my clover chalk marker. I don't need these to last very long. And this is perfect and it should show up really well too. So again, we're going two and a quarter inch down from the top, up from the bottom. And then two and an eighth inch in from each side. And I think those, oh boy, that didn't look straight at all. That's the nice thing about this type of marker. You can just rub it away if it's not right. Did I not have my angle on here right? That looks much better. All right, these say to go all the way to the top and bottom, but, but basically I need to see them here and here. So I'm not gonna worry about going all the way to the top. I'm just gonna go an inch or so beyond that line on each side of that line. All right, so we've got that marked. 
and that's ready to go. We can set that aside. And our next step is to prepare the belt wrap. All right, so for the belt wrap, we've made this, the belt wrap is this part. It's the part that opens up and you put the seat belt inside. And we've done it so that you've got one big piece on the inside, and this is belt wrap A. And then you've got a piece here that has the other side of, we've, we've attached the soft side of the hook and loop fastener to that. On the other side, this one, which is belt wrap C, I believe, we've attached the hook side of the hook and loop fastener. And then belt wrap B is what's going to show on the outside. Actually, I think that's wrong. Let me think about this. Yeah, belt wrap B is what shows on the outside. This is the one that if you want to fussy cut something like we did here where we centered the pandas, you want to make sure that you've got the center of that an inch and a half from this edge over here so that you get that nice and centered in between there. So I kind of did that on this, although on here I've got boots going all the way across. I didn't worry too much about it. But we're going to start by preparing belt wrap A, which is the big piece. The first step of that is to fuse the piece of fusible interfacing to the back. I've already done that on my piece to save some time. And then our next step is to attach the soft side of the hook and loop tape to that. So to make sure that when we close our wrap, our pieces line up exactly, we're going to mark some lines so that we know these match and really hold your seatbelt securely in place. And I'm going to mark these with a washout marker just because I think it'll be easier for you to see. So we're going to begin by marking a vertical line 3 8 7 inch in from the right side. Because my fabric is directional, I want to make sure I have the top at the top so I know I'm marking on the right side. If your fabric isn't, it's not going to matter as much but you wanna make sure on some of the pieces where you're marking them that you know where the top is. It's gonna be really easy for me because of the directionality of my fabric. All right, so we're going to mark a line 3 8 inch in from the side on the right side. When I do markings like this, I always make sure that I have the lines on my ruler on the outside of the fabric because my marking um, pencil or pen, whatever you're using, always adds a little bit to it. So I want to make sure that my lines on the ruler are on the outside of the fabric. And I'm going to mark 3 8 inch in. And then I'm going to mark an inch long line, an inch and a half from the bottom and from the top um, to the inside of the line we just marked. So the length on this isn't really critical. The distance from the top is. But its purpose is to align the hook and loop fastener. So if it's a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, that's not going to matter. All right, we've got that line marked. What did I do with my lid? Right there. And now we're going to attach our hook and loop tape. And can someone hand me a glue stick? So we've got a, thank you. We've got a seven and a half inch piece of hook and loop tape. We're going to separate that into two pieces and we're going to take the soft side of it and center it on here between those lines that we just marked and to the inside of the vertical one. So that's going to make sure that it's positioned right where it needs to be to close the belt wrap. And I like just putting a little glue from a washable school glue stick on the back. Boy, this one is drying up. But that'll work. I don't know if you know, but if you have a glue stick that's all dried up, just put some water in it and put the lid back on it and let it sit overnight and it'll be good as new and ready to use. So I need to add a little water to that one, I think. All right, so I'm gonna center my hook and loop tape between those lines, and actually mine are extending a tiny bit beyond the line, probably because I didn't exactly mark it, but that's okay. Get it centered. And then we're going to sew around this. When I sew around this, I want to sew about an eighth of an inch from the edge, and I want to go around it twice. 
you want this to be really good and sturdy because that's going to get a lot of wear and tear every time you move it or take it off. And so you don't want it coming undone. It would be hard to go back and fix it later. So I'm going to just leave my edge stitch foot on and go around this twice. And I'm going to change my stitch length though back down to a two and a half which is what I usually use to make sure it's good and strong. All right, once around, we'll do it one more time. What's that? Okay. Well, it tells me I can talk while I'm sewing, so. My problem is I have to concentrate while I'm sewing. <laughs> So I may not do too much talking while I'm sewing because otherwise my lines won't be straight. Okay, but it gave me the option. So that's good to know that I can. All right, that piece is on and belt wrap A is ready to go. All right, let's move on to belt wrap B, which actually I have already done what needs to be done on it. It's a super simple strip or step. Basically, because I've got directional fabric, I wanna make sure I've got the top at the top, turn it around, and I'm going to fuse a four and a half inch wide piece of interfacing on, making sure I'm aligning it on this right side. That leaves the left side with no interfacing for a half an inch. Then you just take your fabric and fold it over against the interfacing and press it so that when you're done, you have a four and a half inch wide by 10 inch piece. You don't have to stitch that down at all. The purpose of this whole um, thing is that we want to be able to sew these together and sew all the way around it and turn it here so that we don't have to finish any edges or turn it right side out. We just turn the whole piece all at once rather than trying to turn it through a little opening that's always hard. And so the purpose of that is that we'll have a finished edge all the way around. When you sew this onto the bag or onto the cushion, that seam is hidden in the middle on the back. So that's why you don't have to do anything special to finish it because it's all on the back of the cushion. So, all right, so we've got A ready, B ready. Now we're ready to work on belt wrap C. And for this one, again, we're going to fuse interfacing to the back of it. And then we're going to um, position it so it's taller than it's wide and mark the top with a pin. This is again where I had said earlier that if you don't have directional fabric, there are some points where you need to make sure that you've got um, the top marked because when we mark lines on here, we've got to make sure that we put this where it belongs or otherwise our Velcro won't match when we close it. So on mine, I'm not going to bother with the pin because I easily can tell where the top is. All right, now we're going to mark some lines on this one and we're marking one and three quarter in from the right. Let me make, make sure I read it right. I'm just gonna do it with my chalk marker here. So one and three quarter in from the right and then an inch and a quarter up from the bottom and an inch across. All right, and those are um, positioning lines for positioning our other belt wrap fastener, which is the scratchy side or the hook side. And we're going to align it to the inside of the line marked one and three quarter from the right and between the two marked horizontal lines. So again, I'll just put some glue on there from my glue stick.
That's good enough. And make sure I haven't turned it. I've nope, still got it right side up. So inside that line and under those lines. All right. And then I'm going to do the same thing to sew that piece of hook and loop in place. One question that I sometimes get is where do you sew on the hook and loop tape? I like to sew fairly close to that edge so that I'm not sewing right on top of the hooks. Um, you'll notice that sometimes if your stitching looks a little crooked and wonky, it's because it's hitting those hooks. But if you stay just to the outside of those, usually you can get a nice smooth stitch. I also recommend we use um, SoFine 50, which is a 50 weight polyester thread. I find that especially when I'm sewing on hook and loop, that thread seems to hold up a little bit better. Sometimes a cotton thread, when it goes through the hook and loop tape, um, wants to tear. I'm not sure I went across that twice. We'll do it once more across there. All right, so we've got belt wrap C ready to go. And now we're ready to join the three pieces to assemble the belt wrap. So our first step is to lay belt wrap A out, which is the big one. Make sure that you've got the hook and loop fastener on the right side. Then on top of that, aligned on the right side, we're going to position belt wrap B. And I'm going to just hold this in place with Wonder Clips. You can also use pins. I find that every time I use pins, I just tear the heck out of my hands because I poke myself. So anytime I can use Wonder Clips, I do. When we first designed this, we recommended pins because we had you round the corners um, while it was pinned together, but we figured out an easier way to do that by sewing around it and then rounding the corners. So clips will work. All right, then we're going to take belt wrap C, which is the one that has the scratchy side of the hook and loop. Make sure you've got the top at the top. So if you've got a pin marking the top, make sure it's at the top and then take that pin out because you don't need it once you sew it together. It's just there to make sure you get that positioned right. And you're going to align that along the other edge and you can clip that in place. And then we're going to sew an eighth, or no, a scant quarter, quarter of an inch all the way around this. So I'm gonna to switch to my quarter inch foot and move my needle position over one to make that scant. And we're just going to go all the way around. By sewing the layers together, when we get ready to round the corners in the next step, it's gonna be really easy because nothing's gonna shift and slide on us. So I'm switching my needle position back to the middle putting my quarter inch foot on, and then I'm going to move my needle position over one click to the right so that I have a scant quarter inch seam. And I'm just going to go all the way around this piece. Hopefully I'm, you're all moving at the same rate as I am and keeping up with me. If not, know that you can watch this again and you can also watch um, the video uh, tutorial, the add-on video tutorial that we filmed to go with it. If you've got any questions about anything you're doing, um, Trevor and Brooke are, all, are both watching for those. So um, feel free to share any questions or comments that you have with us. Yes. We do have one question, okay. Yeah, so do we have to have a hook and loop? Is that going to gum up the needle? 
You know, when I glue this, I always use a washable school glue stick and I've never ever had trouble with it gumming up my needle. There are glue sticks that I've used that do gum it up and some that I've had to use alcohol to clean my needle up, but I've never had trouble with this. And you might notice too, I put it towards the middle of the hook and loop and I sewed on the outside. So usually when I put it on, I'm not really sewing through the area where I put it, but no, I've had great success with Elmer's washable school glue sticks. All right, now that we've got that sewn all the way around, we're going to round these corners because it's going to be way easier to turn this and press it and make it look really good if we've got rounded corners. And we're going to just use a two and a half inch circle to do that. The pattern tells you to mark around it and then cut on the marked line, but because I've got this sewn together, I'm just gonna cut. I'm not gonna bother to mark it and then cut. And I'm going to use my rotary cutter because that's just way easier than scissors for me. So when you're ready to round corners, and we do this in a lot of our patterns, um, we think that a rounded corner looks nice. It also makes it much easier if you're doing a dimensional bag to join the pieces um, around a rounded corner. On this particular pattern, it's not a huge deal if you don't have exactly a two and a half inch circle, but if you were joining pieces to make a bag, and I said use a two and a half inch circle, in that case, it's really important. So we love these little rulers that Creative Grids make. They come in a set of two and a half all the way up to six and a half, and we use these all the time. So we've got patterns that call for all the sizes. If you're looking to treat yourself to a new tool and you don't have these, you will never ever regret having them. We absolutely love these and they're strong and sturdy. We've used these hundreds of times and, and they're still two and a half inch. They don't, um, you don't end up slicing part of it away like you do if you're using a plastic or paper template. So the secret when you're rounding corners is to make sure that you've got the edge of your circle aligned with the edge of your fabric on each side. And then we're just going to cut this excess fabric away. And I may have to stand up to do that because my eyes aren't that good from the side. All right, round that off. Cut that and just go all the way around and round all four of your corners. Now when I do my next stitch, I'm going to put a different color of thread in. I found um, earlier when I did this that with the white thread because after we sew around this we're going to clip these corners and I found I could not see where the stitching was um, with the white thread in there and so I'm going to put some blue thread in here so that I can see it more easily when I go to clip those corners. One question that I don't know if anybody's asked yet, but it's a question I get often, is what needle do you use when you're sewing? And we always use a 9014 top stitch needle. It's strong and sturdy. The best thing about it is that the eye is twice as big as a regular needle. So when it's time to thread your needle, you can see it. So if you've got old eyes, you'll love that needle. All right, now we're, I'm gonna move my needle position back to the center so I'm sewing with an accurate quarter inch seam and I'm just going to go all the way around this piece, rounding the corners as I go. And you'll notice that as I go, I'm keeping my foot really parallel to the pieces I go, especially when I go around the corners. I don't want my foot going like that or like that because then I'm gonna ha not have a smooth edge.
All right. Okay, so I've sewn all the way around, nice smooth corners. And now before we turn this inside out, we wanna clip these corners so we can reduce the bulk on these rounded edges. This is a tip that I learned from Mindy, who's one of my um, pattern testers and sewers. And she has a background in garment sewing. And she taught me a trick for making sure that you don't end up cutting through your stitching here. So rather than coming in like this and clipping, which especially if you have old eyes like me, is sometimes hard to see. She takes her fabric and folds it and then cuts, making sure that she cuts from just outside the seam line out. And that gives you a really nice little notch in each corner. So I just fold over a little bit at a time and clip those. Again, sewing or starting from outside the seam line. This is a step that really makes a difference in making your belt wrap lay nice and smooth is getting rid of some of this excess fabric that goes in these corners. And having that blue thread in there made that way easier. It's strange for me to be teaching a class and have nobody talking or answering. So hopefully you're enjoying this and learning something. And if you've got questions, you're thinking to ask them. Um, yes. If there was, if you were sewing this for a child, is there a way you could resize the pattern at all? Absolutely. Um, I would leave the belt wrap the same size as it is because your seat belt's going to be the same size no matter what. But you could make the um, the cushion shorter. I don't know that you'd need to make it much narrower. I don't think. I mean, I think any anybody is going to be about that size. But probably the length would be, and you could certainly make the belt wrap shorter. Uh, what I would say probably do is make one the way it's designed, and then try it on the child that you want to make one for and see what fits for them. But yeah, shorter might be nicer for sure. But for me, and I'm not very big, um, this is a very comfortable size. And you know, the, the cushion part on it's going to bend a little bit too, that could give way. So let us know how you're doing on sewing your bosom buddy. And that was a really great question about resizing it. So again, if you look at this, you're going to want to leave this the same size that it is. It could easily be shorter. This could be shorter. This could be narrower. As far as aligning the Velcro um, or hook and loop, that, well, you're not going to have to worry about that because you're going to make it the same width. So just position those exactly like the pattern tells you. You're on again. I'm on again? Everything's fine. Okay, here we go. This is a learning experience. Thank you for bearing with us. We appreciate it. All right, so we just finished sewing all the way around the belt wrap and clipping the corners. And our next step is to turn that right side out. You're gonna love how easy this is because we're not trying to go through a little opening that we left in the side. It's super simple to reach in, push out your corners on each side of that side and then come around here and push out each, all of these corners. And then you'll just close that up. Take that to the ironing board and give that a nice press, making sure that you don't see, you know, you've got it right on the edges. I've already done one and done that because I didn't want to have to leave and go press but when you're done, it's going to look like this. So we've got belt wrap A with the Velcro attached. You're going to mark some lines once you get it nice and pressed, and those are marked um, two and five eighths and four and seven eighths from the right. Make sure you're measuring from the side that has the uh, soft side of the hook and loop tape attached. And 
on the back, you've got your little opening where the two pieces were, but again, that's going to be hidden when we sew it on. That's our next step to attach this to the cushion front. So get the one that you marked the lines on and align this right in between the lines. So you want to, I want to make sure that I've got my top up on each piece. We're only sewing through the cushion front. We don't want the lines attaching this to come through on the back. So we've got just one layer here. So I'm going to line my lines up there and there. Align it on that line and that line. And then I'm going to put some pins in there. Wonder clips don't really work well on this step. So some pins in to hold that there and on this end. And then we're going to sew this in place. And when we sew this, we're going to sew down this line, across, up this line, across. And I'd probably do that twice too, just to make sure it's good and sturdy. For this, I'm going to use my quarter inch foot and I think I'm going to go across the top first. And I'm going to sew about an eighth of an inch from the top and across the bottom. And I've got my blue thread in there, but that's fine. Again, my stiletto held at a right angle next to it just helps keep the layers together and keeps it from shifting and pushing down. You could use a walking foot on this too. I like my quarter inch foot um, because I know when I'm an eighth of an inch from the edge. I also like that it's wide open in the front so I can really see my line and stitch along that easily. one more time. And when you go around the second time, just try and stitch right on top of the line that you stitched earlier. Get that pin out of there so I don't poke myself. Okay, once you've got your belt wrap sewn to your cushion front, go ahead and close the Velcro so that that's in the middle and it doesn't get caught in your next seams. And now we're ready to join the front and back. Make sure you've got both pieces. If you've, you're using a directional fabric, make sure you've got the top at the top on each and then just layer them on top of each other. Put some wonder clips on to hold those together. And then you're going to stitch an eighth of an inch all the way around to join those layers. You could round the corners before you do that, but again, we found that if the pieces are sewn together, it's way easier to round the corners and make sure that they match. So we'll sew and then we'll round the corners. One question that I'm often asked is, you know, how do you sew through bulk um, when you're working with soft and stable? And, you know, how do you deal with the bulky areas? You know, my, I break needles. I can tell you that I, I rarely break a needle because of bulk. 
And if I do, it's because I'm pulling or pushing on the piece, which then causes my needle to bend and that's what causes it to break. But going through layers isn't going to break your needle. This is only two layers of fabric and two layers of soft and stable, so it's not a whole lot of bulk, but it's a little bit more than what you may be used to sewing. Just keep, let the machine do the work of pulling or pushing um, the fabric through. The feed dogs will do it. Don't pull and push on it and let it go and you should have, it should be easy. The other thing to know is that the more you sew through soft and stable, the more it compresses. So every line of stitching that you, does, that you do through it helps mash the layers down. So we did that first line of stitching to sew the pieces together. That mashed it down a little. This line of stitching will mash it down a little bit more. So when we're ready to attach the binding, it's gonna be a lot flatter than if we were just sewing straight to two layers of soft and stable. So extra layers of stitching in the seam allowance um, will really help reduce bulk if you are having trouble going through lots of layers. I was looking at this and thinking, these sheep throw me every time. I think they're upside down, but they're not. So I've got the top at the top. We've got our cushion back sewn to our cushion front with our belt wrap attached. Our next step is to round these corners so that when we go to bind it, it's going to be super simple and easy. And for this, we recommend using a three and a half inch circle just to make it a little bit more rounded. I am on this one going to mark it and then stitch inside it before I cut it because that's going to hold all my layers together and I'm not gonna have problems with you know, one side of the fabric folding away or pulling away. It's especially helpful if you're doing something that has mesh on one side or the other because the mesh really wants to pull away from the seams and sewing it before you cut it just solves all kinds of problems. So I'm going to mark these. And again, we're only, we're lining our ruler up with the edges and we're just marking around the part that extends beyond the rounded edge of the circle ruler. There is, um, if you downloaded the pattern before maybe the last month, you may not have gotten a pattern with labels for your pieces or templates for the circles. Go download a new version because we've added all of those in the pattern. So. If you, if you don't have circle rulers, you can always cut templates and make them out of template plastic or paper to, to mark around. All right, now I'm going to stitch an eighth of an inch inside each of those. And as I said before, the more stitching in this, the more it compresses the layer. So I usually just go around again. I never worry about stitching an extra line of stitching around it because it just helps to compress everything. And for me, since I don't have an automatic thread cutter on my machine, it's almost as fast to just sew a few more inches than to try and clip my threads and not have them get caught underneath. So I'm keeping the inside edge of the toe on my machine right along that line to stitch an eighth of an inch inside those rounded edges.
Okay, right now that I've sewn that and it's sewn all the way around the edge, I can just take my soaker ruler and rotary cutter and round all the corners. If you end up with something like that, we'll come back and fix that with scissors. Anytime you're cutting through something as cushiony as this, your fabric's gonna uh, lift up a little bit in there and you might get an uneven edge a little bit. So we'll just use our scissors to smooth that out a little bit more. I think I'm trying to hurry a little bit so that doesn't help. All right, so our cushion's ready. Our last step is to make our bias binding and use our binding to trim all these edges to give it a really beautiful finished look. So for that, we've cut an 11 inch square of fabric, which will make just the right amount of binding for this project. And I'm going to just run through real quickly the technique to do that. So I've got this 11 inch square. I've got my 12 inch ruler here and you can see my ruler's not gonna be big enough. What we wanna do is cut this diagonally from corner to corner. Here's a tip. Take this square, and this is especially helpful if you're using um, big squares. On some of our projects we use 24 inch squares and nobody's gonna have a ruler big enough to cut that diagonally. Fold this in half so that you make a triangle, and then take your ruler, line it up on here, and make sure you've got this line even across, and you want your tip right there at the tip. So get that even there and there, and then cut along the edge of your ruler, and that gives you two triangles. So basically, you've cut your square in half, from corner to corner. So then take those squares and we're going to join these to make a parallelogram. And from this parallelogram, we're going to cut our bias binding. If you, um, I'm not gonna go through all the techniques for this, but if you go to our website, we have a free pattern called Easy Does It. And we did a really thorough video in that, uh, for that project that talks about matching stripes, and all kinds of tips and techniques on it. But basically you're going to take one square and position it, I mean one triangle, and position it so it makes a mountain. So it has the peak at the top. You're going to take the other one and position it so the peak is at the bottom. I call that a valley. And you're going to put those next to each other and then fold your valley over onto your mountain and join these along this edge. If you're working with stripes as I am here, it's fun to align the stripes and make sure they match. Um, make sure you watch that video because I've got more tips about that. I'm not going to take the time to really carefully pin each of these, but if, if I was doing this in real life and um, not in a hurry, I would probably put a pin on every single one of these stripes and make sure that when I was done, I had a really seamless, seamless join. All right, so I've got that clip pinned and now we're going to sew across this with a quarter inch seam. We wanna make sure that we're sewing from cleavage to cleavage normally. Because I adjusted this a little bit to make sure that my stripes matched, it's gonna be a little bit off here on the edge. But sew this together with a quarter inch seam and, and then I'll show you what we'll do next. I don't know if you've noticed, but I keep two pin cushions, one with my extra fine pins for pinning fabrics, another one with my heavy duty quilting pins. And I like to have each pin in its separate pin cushion so that I can just grab 
and I'm not having to pay attention to getting the right type of pen. All right, so we've sewn that together with our quarter inch seam. We're gonna take that, actually that looks pretty darn good. We're gonna take that to the ironing board, press that seam open. I'm just gonna do it with my pressing tool here. So press that seam open so it's nice and flat. And then you're going to cut your strips out of this. And for this project, we're cutting two and a quarter inch strips. You can see my ruler doesn't go from side to side, even on a small square like this. So here's another tip. Take that parallelogram, fold it over so that your edges are even down here, and this is going kind of right along that seam. It doesn't have to be right on the seam. It can be off to the side a little bit, but um, get, this is important, that it's straight here and it's straight here. And then you can take your ruler and align it on there and you've got plenty of room. So make sure that this is nice and straight here, that you've got your two and a quarter here. And then I love this little rotating omnigrid mat because I can turn it right where I need it. So there's one strip cut. I normally use my Creative Grids four and a half inch ruler for this because it's got, it's just the right width for two strips. And then I have um, a line marked for the middle on the two and a quarter so I don't have to move my ruler as much, but this works. So you're, you're going to get three strips out of that. If you've got um, the printed patterns, you're going to, we've fixed it on the downloadable pattern, but you're going to notice that the picture for that step shows four strips. You only get three and that's enough. So you've got all your strips cut and then you're going to join those. And you want to join them on the ends that match. So when I first started, I had a heck of a time trying to figure out how to line those up. Here's what I figured out. If I take them and lay them like what I want them to look like when they're done, all I have to do is take this strip, fold it over on top, line it up, get my little cleavage on each end, and then sew across this with a quarter inch seam. I'm not going to do that because I've got a piece already prepared, but you're going to sew across that with a quarter inch seam. You'll press your seam open, trim any dog ears, and join all of your pieces to make one long strip. I've already done that on this. And then what I like to do is take that strip and fold it in a half and pin it every three to four inches. When I started doing bindings, I pressed my binding in half and I had a nice sharp crease and I didn't have to have pins in it, but I was at the very first class I ever taught, I was um, complaining about the fact that sometimes I had wrinkles in my binding and I couldn't figure out why because I thought I was being really careful. And one of the ladies in the class, her name was Cheryl, said, how did you prepare your binding? And so I explained to her what I did and she said, did you press it in half? And I said, oh yeah, I pressed it in half. And she said, well, that's your problem. If you will skip pressing it, you'll avoid those problems. And I have never pressed another binding and not had that problem again. So here's the secret, take your binding, make sure you have it laying flat. We can get this guy out of the way. Make sure you have it laying nice and flat on a table. Bring your raw edges together so they're even and just put your pins in at a right angle so that they're going to be easy to remove. And then I just take my whole piece of binding and line it up. But not having that sharp crease in here really helps to eliminate a lot of the, the wrinkles and stuff that you get in your binding. All right, on this project, this is going to be the part that's visible. So we want the binding to look the best on this side. So I'm going to first sew the binding to the back and then bring it around to the front and stitch it down. When I do my join on my binding, I like to use a diagonal seam because it lays flat and I think it looks the nicest. So I wanna be able to join that where I have the most room. So right here is a perfect place to join my ends. So I'm gonna leave a tail that ends about in the middle of that piece and I'm going to start stitching down here towards this corner. I'm going to stitch with an accurate quarter inch seam all the way until I get about right here. 
and then I'll join my ends, finish stitching my binding in place, and then turn it to the front and stitch around, the, around that edge. So um, I don't clip my binding in place. I never realized I did this until somebody clipped a binding down for me and I got done and had about this much extra binding because I stretch my binding a little bit as I go. So, uh, so clipping it doesn't work. So we're going to go over here. We're going to use our quarter inch um, foot. I'm going to switch back to white thread for this. And we want to sew with a really accurate quarter inch seam. We want to keep our foot parallel to the piece and, um, and our edges of our binding even with our piece. And what you're going to find is that's a lot to pay attention to. So I always say, concentrate on keeping your foot parallel to the piece and your edges even. If you go smaller than a quarter inch, you can always go back and add to it. Just don't go bigger than a quarter inch. And I find that even when I think I'm being really careful to sew a quarter inch, most of the time I'm sewing less. So I will sew around it and join my ends, and then I usually just go back around it again with a, with a really accurate quarter inch seam. Because if your seam isn't an accurate quarter inch seam, your binding's not going to cover the way you want it to. So we've got that in place. And we're just going to start stitching. And again, we're going to try and do really accurate quarter inch seam all the way around here. So as I get to these corners, and corners are one of the things that always scares people, the secret is, again, to make sure that the binding stay in even with the edge and that you're not sewing any creases in it. So as I get ready to do that, I use my stiletto to help hold it in place here. And then I use my fingers here to smooth the fabric out. And if you're having any trouble seeing this, um, watch our video for this project, watch our video for our um, Peacekeeper project, or our Easy Does It. All of those have closer camera angles with Jake right over my shoulder, so you might find it a little easier to see there. Jake didn't want to be in the picture today, so he's on the other side. Uh-huh. I do not use a binding attachment and I was going through my stuff the other day and I found a burning a binding foot that I bought because somebody told me that it really works out really well and I have to be honest and say I completely forgot I had it and I haven't even tried it but um, when I look at the instructions for how it works I'm just not I'm not convinced that it would be easier than this. So no, I don't, but um, I'm open to it. One of these days I need to dig that out and try it. So no, I just use my quarter inch foot and I sew around it. So again, you can see I'm not, um, my binding's not pinned in place. I'm just kind of aligning it along the edges as I go. And I'm using this hand to really keep that binding nice and smooth and flat. You don't want to sew wrinkles in it because that's also going to give you a wrinkly binding. Jake, can you find my triangle rulers? Because I'm going to need those next. They should be hanging on the end of the table. You'll notice that I use this stiletto a lot. I don't think I could sew without it, but it really helps. It's like another hand to really help hold things in place and, and position them where you want them. All right, so we're going to go 
across the top and part way just a little bit down this side and then we're going to join our ends. All right, so we've gone all the way around. We're going to join our ends here with a diagonal seam and then we can finish. And this is a technique, I love joining ends with a diagonal seam because it spreads your seam over a larger area and you don't have a big bump in your binding where your seam is. So the first thing that I do is I move this first tail where we started out of the way and I take my piece that's left here and I give it just a tiny bit of a stretch. Can you see that? I call it hospital bed taut. So it's kind of like putting your fitted sheets on the bed. So I take this and I bring it so that it's even. And then I actually like to use the quilting pin for this because I'm going through more layers. But I pin that to my cushion so that it holds it in place. And I'm just gonna get these pins out of here so I don't get confused. Then I'm going to take my first side of the strip down and align it next to that. And I want to mark where this end of the strip intersects with that end so that I can add a seam allowance to it and cut it and join them. And they're gonna fit really well. So this strip has a top and a bottom, this strip has a top and a bottom. And so I want to find the point where this end of this strip, which is the top, matches the top of the second strip. The hardest thing for me is getting my fingers in here and separating it. So I've got that marked, that's that point. Now I'm going to find this point, which is the bottom of this strip and mark that point on the bottom of the second strip. So not really a second strip, it's the other end of the strip. Okay, so right there. And I put the pin in, so it's just going through that single layer of fabric two or three times so it doesn't come out. Then I can unpin this and lay this out on my cutting mat. I'm gonna go ahead and get these other pins out of my binding because we're done with that. I'm gonna lay this out and I'm going to cut. Now, if I was going to cut from that point to that point, my two strips would exactly match each other and I wouldn't have anything for a seam allowance. So I have to add two quarter inch seam allowances to this. So I have to add a quarter inch. And I've got these little triangle rulers that make this task really easy because they're, they don't get in the way. This one, which is an Omnigrid 98, has lines marked every quarter inch. So I find the half inch line and I line it up so that it's right on top of my two pins. So I've got one line there on that pin, one line there on that pin, and I know if I cut along this edge, I'm gonna have a, a half inch added, so two quarter inch seam allowances. Rather than cutting on that end though, I take my other triangle ruler and I butt it up against that to make sure it's nice and even. I also wanna make sure it's nice and even on this side. I don't think I've ever had it come out so even on my first try. So that was lucky. Sometimes you have to maneuver it a little bit. But I've got that aligned there. Now I can get this ruler out of the way. I can get my pins out of the way because it's the most frustrating thing in the world to hit a pin with your rotary cutter and nick it. And then, and this is really important, I take this ruler and I scoot it up about an eighth of an inch or so. Because I want this um, seam when I sew it, I want it to be really tight. If it's loose, then I'm gonna have wrinkles in my binding. So I'm gonna cut along there, and then I'm going to take these two ends and sew them together. And I will admit that I usually gulp when I look at that because it never looks like there's a half an inch extra, but it always works out. So then just bring your right sides of those two strips together and line them up with your little cleavage on each end. And I usually put three or four pins in here to hold this in place so that it doesn't come undone. If you're working in really tight quarters, like on a carrying strap pad, 
you're for sure going to want that. And you can even use a wonder clip or something on this piece to hold it together. But get those held together, and then we're going to sew across that with a quarter inch seam. Again, all of this is in our video um, tutorials that are online. So if, if you're not catching it all today, check those out. Again, you're gonna have much better camera angles on those. So it'll be a little easier to see. So we're joining this with a quarter inch seam. Not sure I did a perfect job on that, but it'll work. Then I um, take this seam and use my stiletto, my pressing tool end of my stiletto to press that seam open and match my ends up. Now usually, boy, I, I did not do a very good job on that at all. Oh, we're just gonna call it good. It'll be caught in the seam. The one thing that I have learned about sewing is you can stress over perfection. Usually I like to do a little bit better when someone's watching me, but um, you know, it's a cushion. It's gonna go on my seat belt. If the binding's not absolutely perfect, I'm just gonna fudge that right there when I sew it. So I've got that pin. I'm gonna finish sewing here and then um, we'll test to make sure that it covers our edges evenly all the way around. All right, that fit together beautifully. All right, now I'm gonna trim these little dog ears off of here. And then we're going to fold our binding around to the front and test to make sure that it covers our seam. Now, did you see how when I folded that around, I had a whole bunch of wrinkles in it? This is why you're glad, I'm glad I didn't press that because all I have to do is kind of take my fingers along there and massage it, and I can usually get rid of any of those wrinkles. All right, so as this comes around, here's what we want to pay attention to. We want to make sure that this folded edge of this is just past this line of stitching that was used to attach the binding. And I can see already it's not, it's way too far. It's, it's going to, um, it's going to be too far. So that means I didn't sew an accurate quarter inch seam. So I'm going to go back, go all the way around and refine that um, seam allowance, which I have to do fairly regularly. So we'll just start up here at the top. And this time I'm not paying attention to lining my raw edges up dealing with pins, keeping it all aligned. It's gonna be way easier this time around. So now, oh yeah, I'm way off on that seam. Way more than an eighth of an inch off, so. But again, every line of stitching is going to help compress these layers, so no worries. I'm hoping that that area where I wasn't as careful as I should have been isn't gonna come back and haunt me when we go around here. <laughs> but this is the problem with sewing live. You're gonna see. Yeah, wow, on the top and bottom, I'm, I'm a whole eighth less than I should be on both of those seams, so. Good thing I came back and fixed this. If you want a really good, beautiful binding, that's 
that's the secret is make sure you've got a good accurate seam and if you got to go back and fix it do it and you may wonder okay what if my seam was too wide i don't usually have that problem because i make sure i go narrow but if your seam's too wide you're either going to have to unpick it and or unstitch it and redo it or sometimes you can trim your piece a little bit i find i run into that on corners probably um, more often and i can usually trim a little bit away but on a long straight piece like this you're not going to want to trim it because then you're not going to have a nice straight edge so you might just have to unstitch a little bit and redo it if it's too wide all right i think we're better this time so i'm going to grab my wonder clips and we're going to go around this and so I usually start by getting it mostly turned to the other side and then I start clipping it in place. And I don't always clip, sometimes I just start sewing. But um, given that I'm a little bit worried about this corner over here where I said it's gonna be okay and I may have to unpick it, we're going to do the wonder clips. All right, so I wanna take this edge and make sure that it's just past that line of stitching and that looks really good. And I clip it in place and I don't, see that still seems a little bit wide there. So I may go back and refine that a little bit. This looks good. What happens is if your binding comes too far over, then you end up sewing too far in this and your stitch shows on the other side. If it doesn't come far enough, that's actually a little bit better because with a stiletto, you can pull it into place. But if, it, if, you, if it's too wide and you make it fit there, then you end up with loose fabric out here and then you get wrinkles on the outside edge. So, so this is a really important step to make sure that that's even. And see how I've got that wrinkle right there? Again, I just take my finger and I run it along here and massage it out and I, I can pretty much get rid of any of those wrinkles that are coming around those edges. I don't know if you're aware too, Wonder Clips have a right side and a wrong side. And the right side is where you see the color. The bottom side is flat. So I just put them with the colored side up so they don't catch on the machine as they go through. It just makes them a lot easier to work with them. Now see here, it looks like it's gonna be too tight, but that's not a problem at all. I can pull, I can use my stiletto to pull that into place really easily. You can also, um, if you've got wrinkles in there, you can take your stiletto and kind of insert it into the fabric to help get rid of wrinkles too. All right, that looks good. We're gonna call that good all the way around. And now we just stitch all the way around this outside edge to do it. Again, because we have our folded edge just beyond that line of stitching, if we stitch about an eighth of an inch inside this edge, maybe not quite that wide, our line of stitching should pretty much follow up, fall, out in the same place on the other side. I do that with varying degrees of success. And the more I do it, the better I get. And you'll find the same thing. So it takes practice. But if you can use your stiletto to help position it so that it's just past that line of stitching and just work a little bit at a time, um, practice makes perfect or practice makes good. I won't say I'm perfect. Um, as I said earlier, perfection is overrated. This is supposed to be fun. So do the best you can and, and the more you do it, the better you get. Again, notice how I'm using my stiletto to push any loose threads underneath there. 
sometimes you need to just grab them and clip them off. That one. There's my clippers. But I can use that to make sure that I'm pulling it just beyond that line of stitching so all those lines are hidden. Here's a little wrinkle. I'm going to take my stiletto inside here and use it to kind of pull that little bit of fabric out so I can get that a little bit straighter. We're doing sewing classes here at Biani for our staff. So every two weeks on Friday, Thursday or Friday afternoon, they get a couple hours to sew. And this was one of the projects that they all made recently. And I was very impressed with how well they did on their bindings. You can use this finger too to push things up underneath there and keep them nice and smooth. Uh, this is a koala cabinet, which I absolutely love. Um, I think it's one designed specifically for Bernina's. The um, little table is made by So Steady, and it lets you get into your bobbin and see what you're doing. But it's really a, a sturdy table. It's got a little leaf that lifts up on that side, so I've got plenty of room to put my stuff. And then drawers here, and then these. Oh. There's two pieces on the side that, that you can put shelves on and it's fabulous. Having a nice cabinet that doesn't shake and that's the right height for you is so important. And having your machine so that you're not up in the air makes such a difference. Um, but, but I really love this table. And if you check with your local Bernina dealer, um, a lot of them um, can get Koala cabinets for you, even if you don't sew on a Bernina. And they come with all different finishes. You can do white or oak or I don't even know what all the colors are. I like white because it's bright. All right, we're almost to the end. Now comes the moment of truth when we look at the other side and see how, see how well I hit. We don't have any of these little snippers. We sell these at byany.com and I absolutely love them because you can get right up next to your threads and they're curved so you don't end up cutting your fabric, but they're awesome for getting in really tight. All right, so this is the side we just did. Jake, can you kind of show that? So you notice our stitching is pretty close to the edge all the way around. And then if you look at the other side, 
not quite as perfect. Some of it, it's a little bit further out. But it looks like I pretty much hit the binding other than right there where it goes in a little bit. I'm pretty much the same distance all the way around. And I wouldn't be surprised if right there is where I was too lazy to fix that edge of binding that wasn't right. But I call that perfect. All right, so my bosom buddy is done. I'm gonna put this in my car, or maybe I'll give this one to my daughter. She, uh, she has some great little red boots that she wears all the time, and where she lives, she gets enough rain that she needs them. But um, ready to go, perfect for um, somebody who's short, somebody who just wants a little extra cushioning from their seat belt, or someone who's um, had surgery for breast cancer. I hope that you will have enjoyed this today. Send us some comments and let us know what other topics you'd like us to cover. I, we'd love to do this more often. If there's techniques that you want little tutorials on or questions that you want answered, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we thank you so much for your support and your enthusiasm. Uh, you are what make us keep doing what we do. We love hearing from you. We love seeing pictures of what you've made. If you get your bosom buddy done, send us some pictures. We'd love to share them on our social media accounts. And if you don't already follow us on social media, uh, go to Facebook or Instagram. Uh, it's at Patterns by Annie. Um, we've always got fun pictures and we have a photo contest. So send us pictures of what you're making. Um, it's lots of inspiration. We love seeing the things that you do with our patterns or other people's patterns. If you make something using Soft and Stable or any of our products, even if it's not a buy any pattern, um, you're eligible for the contest. And whoever wins the contest gets to go on a, a shopping spree at Biani. So it's well worth doing. Um, we've got lots of video tutorials on our website, four free patterns that are part of our Biani Basics series, that if you're new to Biani, we recommend that you uh, download those patterns and watch those videos because by the time you work through the four projects, you're going to feel comfortable um, basically tackling any of our patterns. For the past at least two years, for all of the new patterns that we've come out with, we've filmed add-on videos to go with them, which also have video tutorials to help you work through the project. And if, you know, if there's no video that helps you and you've got questions on anything you're doing, feel free to call us or email us. We've got great customer service gals who sew all of our bags and they're really good at helping you work through those things. So thank you so much for joining us. This has been really fun today. I'd love to do it again. And so let us know what you'd like to see. Thank you so much. Have a great day.